and welcome to your SUSU election debates live 2014. I am joined by your education candidates. Can we have a round of applause for our candidates, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> now, going from my left, could you introduce yourself and tell, us, tell the audience at home your main policies? I'm Thomas Rogers, and my main policy is teaching second languages to all students here at university. I'm Sophia D'Angelico, and I'm looking to improve communication and, as a result, improve the course rep system. Hello, my name is David Hurd. My key policy will be to try and increase the support to joint honours students. Hi, my name is Sean Coston, and my key policy is to increase the role of SUSU in careers. Can we have another round of applause for our education candidates, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> Now we'll start off with quite an open question. What do you think of the previous SAB's tenure and what would any of you do differently? Uh, we'll start to my right. I think that um, some good work has been done. Um, I think the focus has been somewhat too narrow. Um, the work done on the library has obviously been very beneficial. Um, we're going to see the 24 hour uh, trial soon. But I think I would have focused slightly more broadly on issues uh, from other areas, maybe outside the direct education experience, uh, focusing on things such as, as I've previously mentioned, careers, I think it's a big thing SUSU should be far more involved in. Um, improving the feedback system, uh, making it faster and more personal, um, and increasing student representation. So I would have had more focus. Anyone else have anything to say about the previous staff's tenure? I think there hasn't been that much of a focus on the course staff system. I think possibly because the, uh, the current group in education wasn't involved in it before. He wasn't aware of like, the strengths and weaknesses before he went in, and it took him a little bit of time to get, get involved and realise how much training was involved and things like that. I think maybe more support could be needed. Are you suggesting that you are aware of the strengths and weaknesses? Yes, I am. I've been involved in it for the last four years. <laughs> so. okay. uh, does anyone else have any other comments? Good. Uh, right, David, uh, you suggested faculty officers, academic presidents, course reps need to take the lead behind the scenes to make their roles, uh, to make their roles more stress-free. What does that mean, and how is it beneficial? That the, um, well, I, I personally think the, um, the big problem with for the VP education role is that we sort of we sort of embody all our representation into one person, and that sort of creates a situation where you've got sort of candidates like us sort of going around asking what do you want and being elected sort of on those things and then we get these nice manifestos and not much gets done. If we empower it down to sort of the faculty level and down to the academic president level, these sort of conversations will happen year round. And so that, that's what, so I see myself that if I was to be elected, I would see that the, the for my education role, I would um, work what sort of say work behind the scenes and um, try and, uh, and um, so lead, let the faculty officers and actors lead, lead themselves. Like, one thing I want to, want to do is say, introduce a, introduce a blog for academic presidents so that you can, so they, they have a personal connection with, the, with, their, um, with their student group, with their, student, with their academic unit. And then um, from there, it sort of creates that personal dialogue. And so that, that way, they can, they, the students can see what you're doing what they're doing, what the academic presidents are doing for them, and it creates that communication and dialogue that is then both ways, and that way the representation structure is strengthened by knowing that there's two-way communication down there. Because I know that academic presidents do a heck of a lot to support them, and it's just a real shame that we don't shout about it more. You talk about them doing quite a lot. Do you think they have the time to also be writing a blog saying what they're doing when they could in fact be doing it and doing it all better? I suppose the real question is, what are you, what are you asking is, a, um, a reasonable amount. Of I mean, I would say, let's say like a 200-word blog every like one and a half months, like twice a semester. That's not that much on top of um, the, uh, obviously the work or your degree and all the rest of the stuff you're doing. And that's just just enough to keep that dialogue going and create that personal relationship. Okay. Um, many of you have talked about uh, increasing the speed and feedback we get. How do we improve feedback? And how was your uh, suggestions for it distinguishing you from your uh, opponents. Tom Rogers. Feedback. Everyone, for every single VP education I've ever seen, they always talk about feedback, improving it. But in my point of view, no one's actually managed to, you know, 
have this ideal feedback system that people you know, think that is possible. I, I don't think there is an ideal solution. And I think that if every year we come in, we change the system, we try and make it slightly different, slightly better, we just needlessly you know, change it. He doesn't even have the time to see if those changes have any impact. So my suggestion is that just leave it. Stop, stop trying to muck it up any further and see if the current systems can play out even better. That's an interesting point. Uh, does anyone have a thought to leaving it the way it is? I completely disagree. I'm not saying there's anything necessarily really wrong with the system we have. I just think it could be really improved. I mean, the feedback we have at the moment, we're trying to make it more uniform. That isn't necessarily the way, we go, the way to go. Per department, it could be completely different from department to department. What is appropriate feedback? What's useful feedback? How the students want for feedback? Um, it can differ a lot in just one faculty, so making it uniform across the university makes really little sense. I think there are policies in place that you, to kind of predict how long it should be until feedback comes back. It's about three or four weeks for most departments. That, now those, those policies are in place for a reason. It is, that is a reasonable request. Three or four weeks is definitely a reasonable request. I, I think we should be asking departments to justify why this feedback is late. If it's, a, if it's a genuine reason, like um, I don't know, a staff member has become ill or some, something like that, then fair enough. If not, and there's a staffing issue, like a staffing shortage, that's something we should be looking into. Why should students have less support after wait longer for feedback for something the university could actually, could actually fix? Do you have any more comments on feedback? Uh, I, I broadly agree. I think the only sort of correct solution to feedback is a total move away from the one-size-fits-all approach. I think it needs to be personalised more, um, obviously generally towards the faculty, but also um, it needs to be personalised more per fa for every faculty, um, but also according to the task. Um, too often, uh, different types of test, whether it be uh, a Gobbets exam, a normal exam, a, an essay, a dissertation, they're all treated the same way when I think they should be treated incredibly differently with the way feedback is given on them. I think I broadly agree that feedback should be sort of faculty specific, subject specific. They know what's best for their students. But that's not to say we can't sort of look at best practice between different subjects. Um, I think the a key example I, I find this from my own experience is that um, last year I had a few struggles with feedback from one of my modules and my courses. And talking to with my housemate who does, who does geography, he, he just kept saying, why can't you go to our system, our system, you know. So clearly there's some, some support from other subjects that we do like this system and, saying, and just learning from those who are doing well and applying them into, into other subjects means that we can actually, you know, get the best of both worlds of, yeah, unique feedback for each subject, but also identifying good practice and sort of taking it on board and making it better for overall. Okay. I'd like to take this opportunity to ask the audience for questions. These have to be neutrally worded, addressed to all candidates and they are not an opportunity for point scoring. Do we have any questions for your VP education candidates? The man in the glasses. Thank you. Um, how much, uh, something that you've all raised, which we were just talking about, how much influence do you actually think that you, as VP education, would have of an influence over the faculties themselves in terms of sort of grading and, uh, and, and being able to get um, teacher responses back to your essays and that kind of thing? Side here. Uh, I think that um, one of the most important things about the role of VP Education is not just um, the, it's, it's, an, it's a role of an intermediary between the students and the lecturers. And whilst the commitment is obviously to the students, you have to be looking the other way as well. Um, there has to be better communication, more frequent communication between uh, lecturers or um, faculty leaders and the VP of Communications. Um, I would... How would you increase that? I would make um, meetings more regular. I would make them... Uh, I would make, yeah, I would make meetings more regular and attempt to um, have a sustainable conversation, be it via, via email or in person, so that you're getting a constant dialogue rather than... Um, having it limited to a certain set opportunities. I think it needs to be a more consistent dialogue. So the question of influence, uh, any take? Um, on each side influence, like it being a 
involved in all faculty SSLCs. I think as VP Education, you should be attending all of these. I mean, obviously, if they clash with other meetings, it's very, it can be difficult, especially if they're short notice. But I think you should strive to go to every single one. That way, you know exactly what each faculty is facing, whether it's challenges, whether you can help solve, solve something. Like, so, like someone else has said, what might work in one faculty and work really well might also work in another. And you can provide, if you've gone to all these faculty meetings, you can provide that as a solution and help. I think it's really important to get engaged. Um, just having the SSLC meetings pa uh, minutes passed on isn't enough. Uh, any more comments? Yeah, uh, I think that um, in terms of how the VP education can engage with individual faculties, well, personally, I think the, um, the, the role of uh, it's, it's more of a faculty um, officer who would take the lead on this thing. But that doesn't mean that where I say the role of VP education is that I think it's to reflect the fact that the VP education is a full-time role and so we can dedicate our time into, 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 um, into influencing the faculties. And a lot more support can be done just through sheer man hours and sheer working behind, say again, behind the scenes. I mean, and that's why I think how we can influence um, individual faculties. But I still say the lead should be taken by the faculty officers, because it is their zone, it is their area, and that way it creates the, um, a better relationship that way. I feel like I should say something if everyone else has. <laughs> um, it's not so much about what our influence on the faculty should be, but more the faculty's influence on the individual lecturers. Some feedback, I've got lecturers who all have all the coursework marked and done, handed back to us within the week. I've got, I've got some lecturers who are handed in coursework in third year, and I'm still waiting to hear back from them. So really, it's lecturers tend to mark at their own speed, you know, prioritise their marking, and they can't do everything at once, which is understandable, but you know, it's down to how the faculty should enforce them to adhere to their feedback um, policies that we invoke before we can really move on with anything else. So to answer the question, you don't actually think you would have much influence over it? It's, we have influence over the faculty, but whether the faculty have much influence over the lecture is a different thing. Okay, uh, do we have any more questions from the floor? Uh, this year's been very much characterised by the strikes. Um, that all the lecturers have been uh, taking place. If this industrial action were to continue into the next academic year, um, what would your stance be on it? Did anyone hear that? Sorry, 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 can you say that again? But oh, sorry. Louder. Speaking English. Oh, okay. Um, this year has been very much characterised by the strikes that a lot of lecturers have been supporting. Um, if this were to continue into the new academic year, what would your stance be on it? Uh, what would your stance be on the strikes that are taking place this year if that's continuing to next academic year while you were in power, as it were? Well, my, my, say, my personal position on the strikes is that I, say, I support strike action. I think we should support our lecturers and I think to try and get a fair, fair, so a fairer deal. They have had pay cuts across the board and in general we should support this action by the union to um, sort of reverse sort of the cuts in higher education funding. That being said, I applaud, I completely deplore, sorry, the, the, the <laughs> tactics of the union. The problem that they're using, the, the problems that they're doing, is they're using students as a bargaining chip in their negotiations. That's completely wrong. And they'd be far more effective if they engaged us and, and brought us on side, and they're not doing that. The tactics are wrong. They shouldn't use us as bargaining chips, and they shouldn't use the refusal to mark coursework as a part of their negotiation. It's so not if right. If you were VP Education, how would you engage them? How would you engage with people who are striking and refusing to teach you uh, due to their uh, issues with pay, the current uh, rules? How would you engage that as a student? Well, as a as, as, as student representative for, for um, the university, I think we're so, uh, the real problem is that we don't know, I suppose, where the negotiations are with the university. So that's, I think, the first thing, is I'd actually just try and get a bead on where the negotiations are with the universities in general. But I would I say the only thing you can do is just talk to all the parties, again, talk to the, to the university itself and talk to the union and just see where they are. I mean, that's the only, only thing we, you can do is to work through dialogue. Any more comments? I'm always going to um, back up anyone who's trying to get a day off work. I completely understand that. But I think they're going about, like, I agree, I think they're going about it the wrong way. I think they should be much, much more um, aggressive in their striking and not use the students. They should be going to the vice chancellor's house, do sit-ins, chain themselves to this garden gate, make sure he can't move his car, egging if it has to. But I, I agree, I don't think students should have to suffer, but I think the vice chancellor should. So you're advocating personal attacks at his home 
as opposed to not showing up to work in solidarity? Maybe not personal attacks to his home, maybe not you know, do any criminal damage to his property. Or throw eggs at his house. Okay, maybe not the eggs. Um, Show yourself to his property. Well, it's not causing any damage. Are you aware of his property? Pardon? Are you aware of his property? It might be fragile. He could, he could be fragile. He's got loads of money. Why would he have a fragile house? <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving on. Uh, <laughs> any... <laughs> With that in mind, um, I, completely, I completely agree with the cause. I'm in full support of my lecturers. Unfortunately, not necessarily the tactics they're using. I was actually part of the picket line in the last two strikes. Um, if, if, I'm, if I'm elected for FDP education, I'd get a, kind of get a feel of how students are feeling towards it. And if they were in support, I would try and engage in as much dialogue with the lecturers and the strikers as possible. And try and essentially unite with them. I don't see why this mar marking boycott should go ahead. If we were being more involved and kind of engaging with our lecturers and being supportive, this, wouldn't, this measure wouldn't be necessary. Um, I would like to say one thing quickly. Ultimately, when it comes to dealing with sort of strike action and things like that, it is a political decision, and really, it actually rests with sort of union council. So, whatever they decide, I will go ahead with and, and follow their direction on this issue. If it means that we don't support the strike, then that is what the role I will have, that is the role I'll take, regardless of personal opinion. It's not necessarily a political decision, though. If you're VP Education, your role is to represent students, and as VP Education, your role is to get the students educated. If they are missing days that they've paid for. Uh, surely you have to put politics aside because it's in your interest to have these students have their lectures when you want them when they want them to be. And to that end, it's just we need to come to do an agreement on the, on the table. It's just so that so you can you can work behind the scenes to um, say, to push <laughs> negotiations forward and make the pressure that way. But it it is it is still a sort of an, an issue, issue for students to decide, and we use and council is our main way of getting student, student opinion on these big issues. And you shouldn't let, I, it's not right for your personal views to um, override council. So I would, I would love, I mean, when it comes to sort of other debates on council, I would sort of be there negotiating, sort of like standing on the side of supporting our lecturers at council and urging council to back the, back the motion on that. Okay. Uh, do we have any more questions? Uh. Can you hear me? Okay, um, it's the second slash third year of uh, the £9,000 fees, um, and there's been a lot of consensus around that maybe those £9,000 fees haven't given the promised benefits to education that they should have. Um, and I was wondering, as VP of Education, what would you do to, make, to try and make sure that students are getting better value for their money? I don't, I don't like to answer that. <laughs> Her enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> Sophia. <laughs> go for it. Um, one of my policies was to create more kind of student-led, student-supported, supportive systems. So, um, for instance, reaching out to alumni, for instance, for career advice. I don't see any reason why we shouldn't have a network per faculty offering advice. Things like that I think we could definitely embrace. It wouldn't cost that much money to set up these networks and they're a really valuable source. They're there already, they've been there, they've done that. We can ask them about application processes or on the job, you name it, it's there. Um, that's one idea, for instance, or the peer system, which does actually exist in some faculties and it works really well as far as I can tell. Um, the buddy system already happens with Erasmus students. It should be integrated into our system a lot more. It works really well as a support system, possibly between finalists and first years. If they've got that level of support, I think it's an extra element to the kind of university experience. And it doesn't necessarily mean, it's not necessarily directly linked to the money. The university perhaps wouldn't have to spend more money. It would really, really just embellish what we have at university as an experience. I agree broadly with both those points. Um, I agree that um, SUSU should be far more of on careers, uh, be that uh, older students who've been through um, been to interviews and things, giving support to young students or alumni, certainly would have a valuable role in that. And I also agree in the buddy system, for example, when physics works incredibly well, should be expanded. But the question was about whether people are getting value for money for their £9,000. And I think the answer is that the majority of the 22,000 students out there don't know. People don't know, and they should know. And there should be, people should be um, far better informed of where their money's going, what it's being spent on, and that information should be available for everyone, I think, so that we can, people can judge for themselves whether they think they're getting value for money 
what they think is good value for money, and then as VP of education, I can work to ensure that what people think the money goes where people think the money should go. It was about the value. He said, he said that he felt it was a value for money. We've explained the value for money. Okay. Um, I have a policy in my manifesto about a um, money back scheme. So often you'll get a product in the supermarket and it will say, if you're not 100% happy with this product, then call this number and you, we can arrange to have your money back. Obviously, I'm not suggesting that you get all £90,000 each year back, but I think that for the particular bit that you were unhappy with when it comes to... Um, whether it was the lecturers, the feedback, or whatever, you can apply for that portion of the money back, so provided you've got um, relevant proof. And you think that as VP Education, you can make that happen? I think we can look into it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much for the questions. We will come back to a few more questions a little bit later. Uh, now, Sophia, uh, you suggested digitising all core textbooks. Uh, how many are there? How much would it cost? And how would you fund it? I think that anything that's supposedly core, something that you obligatory have to use as a resource, should be incorporated in the cost we already pay. Students paying nine grand, surely that's enough to co cover the things that we have to use day to day and we're expected to use day to day. I, I honestly don't know off the top of my head the numbers, but I think as far as hidden course costs, that's a massive part of them. If we're expected to, to buy things and they are considered core, why aren't they included? But you're, you're offering to digitise every core textbook, so that's for every module in every class, every core textbook, of which there are many. I mean, I do humanities, so I've, I've used quite a few. That is very expensive, and you... I think something's necessary. It's definitely something I would strive to do. It's already gradually happening. It'd be a case of trying to speed it up as much as possible. I'm not talking about every single text you ever use. I'm talking about textbooks that are the theory, the thing that you use. The minute you start your course at the beginning of the year and the minute you finish it, you'll use the same books. There are a handful of those books that every single person has to have, sort of theory-related. I'm not talking about every single book you'll use doing your dissertation. That's not quite what I'm referring to. No, but it's, it's still a core book. That's still a very broad uh, range of books. For e I mean, if there's just one book per module, that's still hundreds of modules Per, uh, per subject for all the students. Just the, the price of the uh, pub of publication and then paying for that is very important. I think if you're offering that, you, should, you, you need to know if you can, if you can actually pr pr provide it. I've looked into it. At the moment, you can, you can request, you can send off really easily. It's all on the li library website, and I've spoken to a couple of library members, that you can send off and request to have certain percentages of the book. It's either 5% um, or an article or so on for... Uh, you can request to have it sent off and if it's for your, for your course. I don't see why, if articles are being kind of set as core texts, why we can't introduce them, that the lecturer is responsible to make sure as many of those core texts are available to everyone and there's not just that one book we have to fight for. 5%, um, especially if it is 5% of, of that core text rather than the entire book, it should, it should be available to us. Otherwise, it's putting students at a disadvantage. Okay. Uh, what do we all think of the 24-hour library? I'm quite excited to hear your thoughts on this. Tom Rogers. Um, 24 hour library, well obviously it's not quite, like I've, I've not experienced it yet, I've not had to go up at 4am in the morning just to get a seat at the, light, at the table, which is a great idea. Um, people can camp out, well, nobody has to camp out anymore before the library opens, they can just get there nice and early and maybe not even leave at all, that'd be quite nice. They can just stay there all night, sleep out, wake up the next morning ready to see the books. So yeah. I'm really excited to see how it pans, especially during exam period. Any more comments? I think the I think the 24-hour library is actually a really important progression in how we how we support our students. And principally, I think the real thing is sort of a most beneficial side effect of this has is the fact that we now are addressing, I think, a really critical um, uh, disparity in the services we provide to students. Because with a 24-hour library comes now 24-hour provision for, um, 80, for students using assistive technology. Because previous to a 24-hour library, if you needed ATS support to use computers to get the most out of your degree, then you were stuffed. You couldn't work if the library was closed. So, you know, now that we have that sort of 24-hour library, and hopefully, and it hopefully it will continue after exams and into a sort of permanent feature into the next academic year, we will have. So that fairness, so that students who do who do struggle, who do need support to get the most out of their degree, 
they are no longer penalized for that situation and that we now have a 24-hour ATS service. I think, uh, obviously, this is going to make students' lives a lot easier and anything that makes students' lives easier, I'm massively in favor of. Um, but I think we won't see the real benefits until exam season, which is when the 24-hour library is really going to come into its own. So uh, I'm looking forward to that more than anything else, seeing how it does in exam times. Necessarily in favour of the 24 hour library. I think it promotes really unhealthy ways of living your life as a student. I'm not against it. If there's a student demand, I think it's definitely worth having. I personally don't think it's necessary. I'm in the library until midnight a lot of nights in the week, and there's barely 20 people in the whole place. I think the money could be spent in far better places for educational resources. Starting off, digitising core texts, maybe. Um, I just think from the money that's being spent, it could be put in better places. But if there's a student demand, then yeah, why not? Well, it's not just a student demand here. It's in place in quite a few universities across the country. And it, if, if anything, at many of the other Ross groups, it's not just a demand. It's an expectation. It is the expectation that a university of this standard has a 24-hour library. It's not about whether it's healthy or not. It's about providing students with the opportunity to access the library. If you, I mean, if you were VP Education, I mean, presumably you would have the call. Would you, would you keep the library? Or would you, would you evaluate it first and then? I would wait to see the students. There's just been a recent library student survey. Until those results came out, I wouldn't call it. I'd wait until, personally, the library survey that's just happened, I don't know what the results are gonna say. I personally would be inclined to do another survey and do it so that when you log into the library computers, you fill in the survey there and then. And so it's the people who are really, you know, you have much more fair run of people who are actually getting involved in the survey. Because I think it's quite an unfair sample of students that are probably filling in that survey. Not that, wasn't a massive, there wasn't a massive people, massive into, um, what's, what's the word? A mass amount of students even knew about the library survey. A lot of my peers had no idea it even happened. So I'd be tempted to run another survey so when you log into your SUST account, you were encouraged to fill it in there and then as an opportunity that everyone has and go from there, see whether they want it. And then if it becomes 24 hour, start taking consideration, okay, are the facilities for food, is it safe um, to be leaving the library at four in the morning, heading down to Portsmouth, so things like that. There are so many other things to consider. But yeah, in principle, a 24-hour library is a good idea. But like you said, other call, other than Russell universities do have it, and it would be nice to be able to be on par with them. Okay, uh, Tom. Now you talk about Solent being our competitors, and you say you'd like the idea of having a degree in travelling. Could you expand on that? Could you expand on the assessment where you'd like to go? I'm just fascinated by it, really. Do go on. Um, not travelling in the sense that they probably do. They probably are in. I don't know. Thompson or selling uh, brochures. I don't think that's the sort of travelling I was in mind. More for the fact that a lot of people in gap years do go out and they do travel the world and they do, you know, I, I rarely see a person who's had a gap year and don't enjoy it. And I don't think they've learned something from it. And I think it just encourages um, people knowing about other cultures and experiencing them firsthand. Because obviously firsthand experience is the best sort of experience instead of reading out of a textbook. Possibly a languages course, maybe? Or a European studies course, or transnational studies? Well, we'll, we'll come back to that with one of his other policies a little bit later, but for now, uh, Sean. Uh, so obviously in your, in your manifesto, you talk about how people want more space. In the library, there needs to be more rooms. Uh, there needs to be more rooms available on campus. Yeah. Do you not think there are other rooms on campus and people start looking for them? Uh, and there are already rooms on the library. If you would like more rooms in the library, how are you going to do that? Where are you going to find the funding to make, make more rooms or make them more accessible? I think um, this is not an issue most of the time. I'll, I'm not saying that the library is rammed full every day, all day, every day. But when it comes to exam time, it is a real problem. And I don't think anyone can deny that library overcrowding is a real problem at exam times. So I'm suggesting um, the area where books are being reshelved could be made smaller for that small period of time and the gallery could be got rid of on the fourth floor. Put desks in there, put lights in there. You know, it's a start, is what I'm saying. Every, other per every person that we can get into the library is a, is, is a benefit. I would also open up other buildings at the time, like the Murray building. Um, why can't there be more buildings open for people who want to work somewhere that's not the library? Not everyone likes the library, that's facts. Not everyone likes working in the library. Some people want maybe a more, a more talkative environment, a more relaxed environment, whatever, and we should be catering to those people who want to be on, on, on site, on the campus, but not necessarily be in the library. Okay. Um, David, you said if the library is rejected, the 24 library is rejected, you would suggest four to six more computers in the Tesseract. Um, is that enough, and how would you fund it? Well, 
specifically when I'm talking about the improvements to the Tesseract, that's sort of the, a, um, that's specifically to create a 24-hour um, ATS service. Because, like I say, as I've mentioned before, there is a huge disparity in the fact that if you use ATS services, you don't have 24-hour provision. So, I know four to six, it doesn't sound much, but this is, you know, in reflection of the fact there are sort of, that would be a fifth of all the ATS consoles that we have, because there's 30 in the library. So, uh, we add, so four and, to add four and six is actually quite a sizable proportion increase into the Tesseract. I think there is a space within the Tesseract to do that. I mean, you've got this sort of presentation, uh, presentation area at the start, and um, a group space area, maybe we can move that about a bit. There's a make more use of efficient use of space with those seats. Um, and, the, and the real plus of using the Tesseract is, of course, that it's attached to the 24-hour section of the Murray building. And so you're not actually asking the university to open up a new building, open up a new area. The costs of sort of maintaining security, et cetera, are going to be similar, if, if not sort of negligible in terms of increase. So I think it's a very workable compromise that we can convince the university to put its money towards. Uh, uh, Sean, how would you support students uh, with disabilities if elected? Um, I think um, this is an issue that's often overlooked. I mean, I don't really think I saw it in anyone's manifesto, but it's obviously an important issue. Um, we want to be as inclusive as possible, and disability should be no barrier for entry to anything. Um, so generally, I think the university isn't too bad. Um, there are a reasonable number of ramps, um, lifts in places. I would work to ensure this is every building, so that um, things like lecture theatres, I think, need more work done for um, disability access. Um, so that would be my focus for um, disability access, would be on lecture theatres and um, other areas inside buildings. Um, I think in terms of outside on campus, it's reasonably good for getting around. I'd focus on inside buildings, um, making that as easy and smooth as possible. Does anyone else have any more uh, policies on this? I'm quite concerned about um, the students with disabilities who possibly would have to go between campuses and if they find that if they have physical disabilities and they find that difficult. For instance, l students who have to kind of, for instance, go backwards and forwards in Highfield and knock, whether it's possible to kind of make sure that that isn't something with too many time restraints and make their lives slightly easier. That's something that concerns me. Have you got a solution for that? Yeah, make sure that timetabling can take that into consideration so that we can if it's possible to timetable things that aren't back to back and to give, at least give them more time, if not kind of eliminate the situation altogether by holding those modules here rather than there. But it depends on the, obviously depends on the subject. Okay, and now I've had a tweet in from Ollie Coles who wants to know if you could make one more degree programme at Southampton University, what would it be? Um, I think in sort of one more degree programme, well, I think actually, that, <laughs> so, sort of degree program or module, I suppose. Uh, um, I suppose one thing I would look towards to, to implement is that I think that we've got the, the whole system of curriculum innovation is um, completely underused and not well directed. And I think I would probably try and push towards, you know, trying to work with, you know, our say work with our student groups because the curriculum innovation is meant to be uh, a way of broadening out your subjects, so, you know, or working on breaking out from your subject. You know, you've come to university to do one thing, but you might suddenly have interest in another area. And curriculum innovation is a way to push that forward. And we also do that with, of course, sort of the various student groups you get into. I mean, you may not have been involved in media before you came here, but you've come and joined, so worked with Surge, worked with CCTV, and you found an interest in that area. And it would be good for curriculum innovation, for example, to sort of capture that interest and, um, and sort of allow you to explore these new interests further. And that's what I would try and, try and push towards. It may not perhaps be a new degree area, but in terms of the new subject modules, I would say push curriculum innovation to really match those what students are doing and what they would want to do having come to university to really sort of, in terms of broadening out their, their academic um, experience. I would, uh, the first place I'd look, I don't have a definite answer, but the first place I would look would be uh, bringing back the sports science degree. Um, we had one of the best sports science units in the country. Um, it was popular, a lot of people did it, and that is the first, so it was very popular here, and I would look, that would be the first place I'd look at bringing it back. I would be recommending um, a degree that would kind of essentially incorporate 
a global business aspect of it and two languages. We also have something, we have something at the moment which is European studies, contemporary European studies and two languages, which means you do, say, Spanish and French and then each, each semester you go into a different department. So you go into do one introduction to politics, then you do a sociology module, then you do a business studies module and the entirety of your degree, you're kind of getting a feel of all the different aspects of your, of, that you can take. And it's really, really in depth. It's for the student that doesn't want to limit themselves to that one area and wants to be able to go out and have kind of an idea of a kind of a globalised business concept, essentially. Well, my one just goes back to the, the travelling degree, which we touched on earlier. Um, it, yeah, it's just about going out, experiencing new cultures, making students be able to find themselves really, truly. And um, you say about languages going off abroad, it's more about just going to one or two places with the, where you know the language. You're not always going to go to somewhere where you know the language. It's about how you overcome the language barriers and just how you cope with being put outside your comfort zone. Okay, uh, now we're coming to the end. So uh, just final statements, if you can say in a sentence or two, why the public should be voting for you uh, in a very brief sentence. Uh, right. I think uh, people should vote for me because I am a fresh set of eyes on a, very, a set of very old problems. Um, I would work to focus on not only the direct educational experience, but the educational experience outside your degree and um, looking at giving you better value for money. And I think I can see it make massive improvements in all three areas. So yeah, vote for me. So I think you should vote for me if you want open communication from all your, all your reps and sort of complete sort of flexible support in, in everything you do, both academic and extracurricular. I vote for me as someone who's already got four years experience in the, um, in the course rep system. Um, I can hit the ground running straight away and just get launched into my ideas without having to kind of get an idea or grasp of how the system works. Uh, vote for me if you want an uh, the chance to apply for your money back for degrees and if you want the sh lecturers to go strike on Don Upbeam's doorstep. Okay. Um, just very, very briefly, um, a lot of you talk about focus groups uh, in your manifestos. Have you spoken to students before today? Uh, and if so, what have they told you they want? Very briefly, Tom. I've spoken to many students, yes. Um, well, they all think the £9,000 obviously is too much. They all think the strikes are bad, and they think feedback needs improving. So yeah, those three. Um, one of my roles, which I'm not sure if I should mention, is I meet students every two weeks and collect, get feedback from their year groups. Um, and so I'm quite in, I feel like I'm quite engaged with how the, what they want and how they feel. And we've been discussing which lectures should be recorded and which ones shouldn't. And we've kind of come to, come to some sort of agreement that the, information, the ones that provide information, things like the ones that explain, say, health and safety before we go on the year abroad, for instance, in our course, it will be different for every, every degree programme, obviously. The ones that explain what the dissertation is about, things like that, they were the ones that should be recorded. If we're going to record any elections, those are the ones. The ones that students want to refer back to, say, in six months' time for that one detail that they might have missed and not written down, they're the ones that we should be recorded. And that record, recording lectures in general isn't necessarily the best, the best way to go because it's not actually encouraging engagement. It's not encouraging interaction. And we really want to take a step back from those things. If we did, we'd probably be going for an open university course and not here at Southampton. Um, speaking with the students that I've so I've talked to, talking to uh, what we've been talking about is mainly sort of like sort of the sort of peer support mechanisms that we currently have. Um, it's really good sort of listening to the dedication of the his, of history society in working up their um, e mentoring scheme, and it's, uh, saying and talking about that. And also a lot of focus uh, is actually is of course on um, how we're supporting joint honours, sort of the problems that joint honours students have faced in terms of like choice of their dissertation and the modules they have to take to match that. Um, and also sort of like the clashes of introductory lectures caused by the fact that the two subjects are, just aren't talking to each other and, all, and other issues like the fact that... Uh, sorry, no, no, I, sorry, I have to move on. Um, from the people I've talked to, they, they tend to feel that they just, they generally want more influence, more influence over SUSU, more influence over their modules. They want to feel like when they give feedback on module forms, or when they attend focus groups, or when they make suggestions to course reps or whoever, they want to feel like they're being heard. They want to feel they want to make a, they want to feel like they can make a tangible difference, and um, I would work to ensure that. 
Okay, those are your VP Education candidates 2014. Uh, up next, I think we've got VP Engagement. Thank you very much for watching this is Masusi TV. A round of applause for the candidates. Woohoo!